In this section, we're going to take a look at how TCP provides reliable data transfer, and we'll see that TCP uses all of the mechanisms that we studied earlier, checksums, acknowledgements, sequence numbers, timeout and retransmit, as well as pipelining. And we'll also take a look at how TCP estimates the round trip time between a sender and a receiver and how it uses that to set the timeout interval. We'll also take a look at a number of TCP scenarios looking at the TCP sender and receiver in action. So let's get started. Well, as we've seen, TCP operates in a point-to-point -point manner that is between one sender and one receiver. And the semantics of its reliable data transfer is that of an in-order byte stream. And we should contrast that with UDP, where we saw UDP was message-oriented. What TCP implements is a reliable byte stream abstraction. TCP is also full duplex, meaning that data payloads can flow in both directions. The data that's contained as a payload in a TCP segment has a maximum segment size of MSS, and this is typically 1460 bytes in practice, but it could be any of a number of different values. As we've seen, and as we'll illustrate shortly, TCP uses cumulative acts, as in go back in. It's a pipelined protocol. It's also connection oriented, which means that there's a handshake that occurs between the sender and the receiver before data actually begins to flow. We'll take a look at that handshake procedure shortly. And TCP is also flow controlled, which means that sender and the receiver are speed matched so that the sender won't overwhelm the receiver with data. Let's next take a look at the TCP segment structure. And I know this can seem a little bit boring and there's a lot of fields here, so it may seem a little bit dry. But remember, the thing to keep in mind is not just what the fields are, but why those fields are there. And all of these cases, we'll see from what we've learned already about the principles of reliable data transfer that we'll be able to understand why TCP has these fields. Okay. So let's get started. We've seen a port number and a destination port number used for multiplexing and demultiplexing before. The TCP header also contains a 32-bit sequence number and a 32-bit acknowledgement number that we're going to look at in just a second. Down at the bottom, we see the application data. That's the payload being carried by the TCP segment. The TCP header also has an internet checksum, just as we saw in UDP. TCP also has a set of options, and there's a variable number of options that can be included. We're not going to go into those, but that makes the header that we see here a variable length. So we can carry options in a TCP header, and because the header can be a variable length, we need to have a length field of the TCP header itself. The reset, sin, and fin bits are used for connection management. We'll study that shortly. There's a field in the header that's used for flow control where the receiver can tell the sender the number of bytes it's willing to accept. There are two bits in the header that are used for congestion notification. And again, we'll take a look at that later. And then finally, there are two bits and one field, the urgent field, which are not really used in practice. Let's take a deeper dive into the meaning of TCP's sequence number and acknowledgement number fields here. Remember that TCP implements a byte stream abstraction, and the sequence number carried in a TCP segment header indicates the byte stream number of the first byte in that segment's payload data. The acknowledgement field is used by the receiver to tell the sender the sequence of the next byte that's expected to be received from the sender, and that number serves as a cumulative acknowledgement for all bytes of data that have occurred before that sequence number. And lastly, students often ask, what should a TCP receiver do with out-of-order segments? The TCP specification places no requirements here. That's up to the implementer. So let's next look at a very simple example of TCP in action, looking at sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. In this example, we're looking at a simple Telnet scenario where host A sends a character to host B, and host B echoes that single character back. So you're going to want to take a careful look at the sequence and ACK numbers on the segments shown in this example. The key thing to note here is that the ACK number of 43 on the B to A segment is one more than the sequence number 42 on the A to B segment that triggered that acknowledgement. 
Similarly, the act number 80 on the last A to B segment is one more than the sequence number 79 on the B to A segment that triggered that acknowledgement. Well, we've seen that TCP uses sequence numbers and acknowledgements pretty much as we would have anticipated from our principled study. We saw that there were a couple of differences, the byte stream semantics and the fact that sequence numbers and acknowledgements corresponded to offsets in that byte stream. Let's next take a look at an issue we really haven't addressed yet, and that is how should the timeout values be set? And let's take a look at how TCP does that. Now clearly, we're going to want the timer values to depend somehow on the round trip time, the RTT. But how do we actually set that timer value? If we set it too short, what will happen is that we'll have premature timeouts. That means that we'll be resending segments that have not actually been lost yet. On the other hand, if we wait too long, TCP is going to be slow in reacting to segment loss. So a key question we're going to have to address is how do we estimate the RTT? Well, we can actually just measure that. Start a timer when a segment's transmitted, stop the timer when an ACK is received for that transmission, and then we've got a sample measured RTT. But as it turns out, those samples can vary quite a bit from one sample to the next. So what we're gonna to wanna to use is something that's a little bit smoother, an averaged value of the sample RTT. So this is how TCP recomputes the estimated RTT each time a new sample RTT is taken. And this process is known as an exponentially weighted moving average. And it's shown by the equation here, that the new value of the estimated RTT is one minus alpha times the old value of the estimated RTT plus alpha times the sample RTT that was just taken. And this value alpha can be set to reflect the influence of the most recent measurements on the estimated RTT. A typical value of alpha used in implementations is 0.125. The graph at the bottom shows the measured RTT between a host at the University of Massachusetts and a host in France, as well as the estimated smoothed RTT. Given this value of the estimated RTT, TCP now computes the timeout interval to be the estimated RTT plus some kind of safety margin. And the intuition behind setting a safety margin is that if we're seeing a large variation in the sample RTT, the RTT estimates are fluctuating a lot, then we'll want a larger safety margin. So TCP computes the timeout interval to be the estimated RTT plus four times a measure of deviation in that estimated RTT value. And here the deviation in the RTT is computed as the exponentially weighted moving average of the difference between the most recently measured sample RTT and the estimated RTT at that time. Well, with our detailed knowledge of how TCP uses sequence numbers, acknowledgements, and the timeout mechanisms, we're now in a position to summarize the behavior of both the TCP sender and the TCP receiver. Once we do that, we'll then take a look at a couple of scenarios showing the TCP sender and receiver in action. Given these details of TCP's sequence numbers, acts, and timers, we can now describe the big picture view of how the TCP sender and receiver operate. You can check out the finite state machines in the book. So here, let's just give sort of a English language textual description, and let's start with the sender. On the event that data is received from the application, TCP is going to create a segment with a sequence number and send that message, assuming the message is within the sender's send window, and start a timer if the timer is not already running. And you may find it useful to think of there being just a single timer for the oldest unacknowledged segment. How a single timer or multiple timers are used is really an implementation detail. On the event of a timeout, the segment that caused that timeout will be retransmitted, the timer will be restarted, and on the event that an ACK is received, if the ACK acknowledges previously unacknowledged segments, we're going to want to update what's known to be ACK, and we'll want to restart a timer if there are still unacknowledged segments flowing between the sender and receiver. Let's now turn our attention to the TCP receiver and the events that can happen at the receiver and how the receiver generates acts in response to these events. Well, the first event that could happen would be the arrival of an in-order segment with the expected sequence number. 
Now, in the case that all of the data up to this expected sequence number has already been acknowledged, rather than immediately acknowledging this segment, many TCP implementations will wait up to half a second for another in-order segment to arrive and then generate a single cumulative act to cover both segments, thus decreasing the amount of act traffic. The arrival of this second in-order segment and the cumulative act generation that covers both segments, that's the second row in this table. In the case that an out-of-order segment arrives with a higher than expected sequence number, there's going to be a gap that's now detected. In this case, remember TCP will send a duplicate act indicating the sequence number of the next expected byte. And the last event is the arrival of a segment that partially or completely fills a gap at the lower end of the receiver window. In this case, the receiver is going to send a cumulative acknowledgement acknowledging all data that's been received in order so far. To solidify our understanding of TCP reliability, let's take a look at a few retransmission scenarios. In the first case, a TCP segment is transmitted, but the ACK is lost. In this case, TCP's timeout mechanism results in another copy being transmitted and then re-acknowledged by the receiver. In the second example, two segments are sent and acknowledged, but there's a premature timeout at the sender for the first segment, which again is retransmitted. The important thing to note is that when this retransmitted segment is received, the receivers already received the first two segments and so resends a cumulative acknowledgement for both segments received so far, rather than just an ACK for this first segment. And in this last example, two segments are again transmitted, the first ACK is lost but the second ACK, a cumulative ACK, arrives at the sender successfully and so the sender can then transmit a third segment, knowing that the first two segments have arrived even though the act for the first segment was lost. Let's wrap up our study of TCP reliability by discussing an optimization to the original TCP known as TCP fast retransmit. Take a look at this example on the right. Here we see five segments that are transmitted and the second segment's lost. In this case, the TCP receiver is going to generate an ACK100 acknowledging the first received segment. However, when the third segment arrives at the receiver, the TCP receiver sends another ACK100 since the second segment hasn't arrived yet, and similarly for the fourth and the fifth segments to arrive. Now, what does the sender see? The sender sees the first ACK100, this is what it had been hoping for, and then three additional duplicate ACK 100s arrive. So now the sender knows that something's wrong. It knows that the first segment arrived at the receiver, but the later three arriving segments at the receiver, the ones that generated those three duplicate ACKs, were correctly received, but they weren't in order. That is, there was a missing segment at the receiver when each of the three duplicate ACKs were generated. With this fast retransmit optimization, the arrival of three duplicate acts causes the sender to retransmit its oldest unacknowledged segment that we see here without waiting for a timeout event. This then allows TCP to recover more quickly from what is very likely a loss event. Well, that pretty much wraps up our study of TCP reliable data transfer. I hope you feel good about the fact that the mechanisms that we developed in our RDT protocols are exactly those mechanisms that are used by TCP in practice. And actually, we'll see these mechanisms come up again when we study the HTTP3 protocol, an application layer protocol used by the web. I'm going to wrap up here by looking at two topics that are somewhat related to reliable data transfer. That's flow control and connection management.